Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Britton, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the bucket class this morning. I thought we were going to have a sunny spring day, but at least the temperature feels better today, doesn't it? Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you to turn on your T coil and turn off and put away your cell phones. And now I'm very happy to introduce again Dr. J.R. Paulson, who will talk to us some more about mental health. Let's give him a welcome. Thank you again. How's the sound in the back, Dave? Okay? Good. Get the lights and then. Hopefully, if you stare at that, it moves a little bit. <laughs> brain is tricking you. Mental illness, class three, a new paradigm. So I'm going to be right up front with you, and I'm going to give the punchline right away now. I'm going to tell you what I'm up to. I'm going to give you four statements to where I'm going. And then I've got to use the rest of this class in the next one to try to convince you of that. Although I've tried to set the ground with the first two. Okay, so my first hypothesis, we are all animals, not very far removed biologically from the forested jungles. Actually about 10,000 years. We are still a fundamentally tribal or social species. The great majority of mental illnesses and violence stems from a disintegration of our communal bonds and tribal values. Think about that. This occurs mainly through the mechanisms of sexism, racism, and economic equality. <laughs> That's where I'm going to prove that, all, that most of this ends. <clears throat> Biochemical changes in the brain, function, and pathology are usually secondary to defects in our thinking. So we get mentally ill because we think screwily, I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> and or the loss of social and communal support, or both. So that's where I'm going with this. That's the summary you go home now or whatever. You've heard it. So last. In this class, we'll discuss the effects of labeling and stigmatizing using the Rosenhan experiments and sexuality as examples. We'll analyze post-traumatic stress disorder in a new paradigm. And we'll look at alcoholism and drug abuse in a new light. Okay? Here's your test. Who's the crazy one in there? Well, we know it's not him, because he feigned mental illness to get in there, to get out of working on the uh, prison group. So, he's not the crazy one. He faked it to get in. Things did not work out too well. Well, hmm, this experiment, I think, was for the, before the movie. How many people are familiar with the Rosenhan experiment? Good, we have one back in the corner. 1973, to investigate whether psychiatric staff can reliably, that's reliably, and accurately distinguish the sane from the insane. So these are the professional psychiatrists. Can they tell crazy people from crazy people? So, it's also called, called the Thud Experiment. It was an experiment conducted to determine the, the validity not reliability, not validity of psychiatric diagnosis. The experimenters feigned hallucinations to enter psychiatric hospitals and then acted normally after. They were diagnosed with psychiatric disorders that were given in antipsychotic drugs. The study was conducted by psychologist David Rosenhan, Stanford University professor, and published in the Journal of Science in 1973 under the title of Being Sane in Insane Places. Methods. Eight subjects were used as the pseudo-patients. Three of them were women, five were men, including the author Rosenhan himself. Their mission was to present themselves to 12 
psychological hospitals or psychiatric hospitals in five different states on both coasts of the United States. We want to present to different hospitals, state universities, and uh, trying to feign craziness. So what they did was they said, they presented these hospitals said that they're hearing a voice. Oh, the people say, oh, what's a voice say? What's it say? And they say, it says empty, or hollow, 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 or I hear this thud, 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 thud. Beyond alleging this symptom and falsifying their names, they couldn't tell them where they were, of course, the locations, no other falsehoods were told. About a mission to the war, the pseudo patients are reportedly to have ceased cease to claim symptoms and behave as normally. So when they got in there, they don't, they're not hearing anything, anything else. They're not acting as we they're normal. Now, who were they? They're a grad student in psychology, three psychologists, a pediatrician, a psychiatrist, a painter, a housewife, and Rosenhan himself, a PhD in psychology. And they would only be released when the institutions felt that they were ready. They did have some lawyers in the background in case they decided to keep them there forever. <laughs> while in the institutions, they all took copious notes on the behavior of the staff and other patients. While they were they said, well, let's take some notes on other people. Let's take some notes on the staff. Results. Seven were diagnosed with schizophrenia, and the others, at a private hospital, was diagnosed with manic depressive psychosis. None of the staff even suspicioned that they were imposters. The staff caught on to none of them. But 35 of the total 118 patients expressed the suspicion that they were actually sane. So they were like, wait a minute, I don't really think you're crazy. But the staff didn't. All patients were put on psychotropic medications. Well, they're not going to take that, they're not crazy. So they you know, put it, cheek it, and then put it in the toilet. So they never took their antipsychotics. But they were never ever caught doing that, which brings up another point, if they could all. So their stay lasted, they thought this would be a few day trip. Seven days to 52 days, and the average stay was 19 days. None were released from the hospital until they agreed with the psychiatrist that they were crazy. They were mentally ill and would take their antipsychotic drugs despite having no symptoms as outpatients. That's the only deal EM ever got out with if they did those two things. They noted the average contact time with the doctors a day was 6.8 minutes. Wow. Rosenhan himself, who would expect to be released in a couple of days, was there two months. <laughs> He wants to get out and write the journal article on it. They don't run for two months. So he concludes, it's clear that we can't distinguish the sane from the insane in psychiatric hospitals. Hospital stuff imposes a special environment. But the meaning of behavior can easily be misunderstood. Uh, these people were powerless, depersonalized, segregated, mortified, and self-labeling. So, my conclusion, star, remember important point. Another conclusion I draw is the harm and consequences of being given a diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia. That is, what does that do for future employment? What's it going to do for your insurance rates? How are they going to treat you? They want you labeled as crazy or whatever. And what are your own feelings of your self-worth if someone labels you as this? Now, they did a great follow-up experiment. So a well-respected university, and I'm not going to mention which one, says, ha we would never do that. We're the ivory tower. We're the university. I don't, it was not the University of Iowa for those people. No, no, that could never happen here. So Rosenhan said that, okay, over the next three months, I'm going to send a bunch of pseudo-patients to you. And I'm not going to tell you who they are. I'm going to send you all these pseudo-patients, and we'll see if you guys are smart enough to to catch the fakes from the real. Pretty good experiment, right? So over the next three months, this psychiatric hospital, well-known, big hot shot, of 193 patients, 41 were considered to be imposters. It's 
So they said, these guys are cheats, these are fake old. I mean, you know, these are crazy. And these other 42, I don't know, but I'm a little suspicious. Well, in reality, he's seven little patients. Oh my God. Well, that's kind of the flip to this. What originally happened, isn't it? So, let's change to human sexuality. Normality, illness, and labeling. What's normal and what's abnormal in the area of sexual behavior? Are certain behaviors a mental illness, or are they just deviant behavior against certain cultural norms? Who decides? Is the Bible, the DSM-5, is that what decides if it's right or wrong, or, or aberrant sexual behavior? What benefits do Big Pharma have in these conditions? Diagnosis, diseases. Hmm. Oh, go back to my model. Let's start with a patient as a child, a little child. He's got thoughts, he's got feelings, and he has behaviors. And he doesn't know if his thoughts, feelings, or behaviors are normal or abnormal. He doesn't know or she if they're right or they're wrong. Correct? Ah, who's the first imprinter? <laughs> Parents. So Freud wasn't all wrong in this, talking about, well, eh, how you were raised your parents. Parents, we are, for a right or wrong, the arbitrators original of this. And so if a child does something or says something, we go, oh, Johnny, or Susie, don't do that. Well, that's bad, it's wrong. So, the circle around the patient is the parents. Very strong influence. But, what happens if kids get older? They get adolescence. Who's the bigger important circle now? The parents? Nope. It's the peer group. It's your friends. That's natural. That's supposed to happen, right? Reject your parents, your peers. So what they say and how they judge is more important. So you wear the clothes that your peers think are for, not what your parents tell you to wear. Right? That's good. That's normal. That's healthy. Now, my model. Doctor, patient, disease. So where does disease come in? Oh. Now, we label you. Now, kids are the worst. We know that. So, if Johnny, for example, is out of the playground, or he's acting a little feminine, and some of the other guys say, Hey, Johnny, you're queer. Oh, yeah. And he picks up a label. Susie is fat. Hey, piglet. What happens? What do kids do? They hop on that. And if you're a kid, you have any? No, no. And that can go on. So if you're acting a little feminine as a guy, you pick up the queer, the faggot label. Does that just go by in the next couple days? No. So, kid's still not worried he's got a disease here. But the doctor could say you have a disease. Oh, you have homosexuality. What about sexual feelings? I spent a lot of time on this, but as you'll see where I'm going, we used to think you're gay, you're not gay. The studies showed that no, people have thoughts and feelings. It's a continuum more. And so it's when you act on behaviors that other people see it. But what's going on in thinking inside isn't, isn't always seen to everyone. So now, the other big circle, society. So now, here you're the patient, you've got these feelings, and the doctor says, you got this disease, because our book says, you're homosexuality, you're, you're, you're homosexual. How do your parents see that? How do your friends see that? Are they more accepting? How does society see that? So see these circles? It isn't just about the disease. The disease is in this context, this context, and this. And what should the treatment be? Aversion therapy? What's the medical diagnosis? 
Ah, homosexuality is not a mental disease, and thus there's no need for cure. Remember we talked about this last time? Ah, oh, voila, I don't have a disease anymore. But other people would say, yes, you do. We don't care what DMS three says. Now, don't have a disease for the doctor. So now what? Does that make the patient or the person feel like, oh, well, I'm all okay? Well, gay magazine, the publication, yeah. 20 million gay people were cured on one day. Isn't that amazing? Psychiatrist dropped sick leave. How do the parents or others react? So I went through this in practice. So guess who comes in my office after a couple, even years after this? The Catholic parents, when they find out their son is gay. It's not a disease now, but the parents want me to change their gay kid or get him some help so he will not be gay. So I get up my man and say, well, it's not a disease, mom and dad, don't worry about it. Oh yes, but these fundamental Catholic, this is a disease and their kid has got problems. So see, just because it goes off the disease list doesn't mean anything has happened. So here's the timeline. Gee, U.S. says 73, no more mental disease. I told you it was, wasn't until 1990 that the World Health Organization said it's no longer mental disorder. 97, China first decriminalizes it. It was criminalized, not just a mental disorder. 2001, China declassifies it as the mental disease. And finally, this court rules against to correct homosexuality. Because in that society, they could try to correct your behavior. Now, what about other places? Just because we say it's not a disease, what about in Egypt? Penalty, prison. Iraq, oh, there's no outlaw, but self-proclaimed sh Shia judges can issue death sentences. And they often can kidnap and kill gays. You can see what the different things are. Morocco, fine. Death. Saudi Arabia, our ally. Prison. Man, boy, sex tolerated in some tribal things in Pakistan. Death penalty if you're married. Saudi Arabia. So around the rest of the world, what about an illness? What about marriage? What about rights? What about marriage? Well, you can see how it is very varied in different parts of the world. So just because of WHO or whatever, you see the important point I'm making here is society and science. Okay, who should you treat it? Should you still treat it? What's the role of the media? How many remember this show? Who's that family? Ozzy and Harriet. Any of you remember? I grew up on Ozzy and Harriet. From 52 to 66, they were one of the role model families. But this is my all-time favorite. What's that? Leave it the Beaver. How many people are familiar with that? Everybody's hand goes up. I was raised. This is the way families are supposed to dress, act, behave, right? Suburban, white America. But that was the, right? The media presented that to us. Ah, flash forward. What is this show? All in the family, which runs. Now, the media has changed. Why is this really key? What's so special about All in the Family, besides being so blank and funny? Do you guys like it? It's unbelievable. But, star, important point, it broke ground for highlighting many serious cultural social issues, such as Racism, infidelity, homosexuality, women's liberation, breast cancer, rape, religion, impotence, abortion, miscarriage, menopause, and the Vietnam War. We're all on mainstream, May night TV. See how powerful that was? They're bringing these issues up. The archery, of course, would be on one side, and the meathead would be on the other. But they brought them up. Powerful, powerful, the media. media. Ah, 1993, who's that? Ellen DeGeneres. What, why do I have her slide up there? She started in 1993. 
And what did she do four years later? She came out. She came out of the Oprah Winfrey show. What bigger audience? So now, what, what are you saying as a society when on TV, on the Ellen show, and she says, I'm gay? Forward a few more years. How many people have seen this? Modern Family. Raise your hand. It's very, very, very popular. Three different types of families. Not the nuclear, leave it to Beaver family. Yes, they have one of those out there. But they have the mixed family, and, and then the gay family, yes. So these things, the culture of the media, I want to show you, is really important. Remember what it did with uh, mobile personality disorders? How we could create them? What about other sexual behaviors? Again, who decides what other behaviors are to be considered deviant or abnormal or a disease? Fetishism, sadomasochism, along with other behaviors, are now repealed from Sweden's official list of medical diagnoses. So they said the National Board of Health and Welfare announced six diagnoses will be deleted from Sweden's national version of the ICD codes. So, gee, all of a sudden you've got one of these orders, you go to Sweden, you're okay. And the reason they did it, it increases the risk of social stigmatization. And these diagnoses are rooted in a time when everything other than heterosexual missionary position were seen as sexual perversions. We hit on something there. Changes emphasize these are not illnesses and of themselves, nor are they something perverse. So this is the Swedish government coming out and making some statements on that. What about other sexual dysfunctions? Community surveys that we have discussed also uncovered an extremely high prevalence of sexual dysfunctions in general. 43% of women, 31% of men have suffered from a sexual dysfunction in the previous 12 months. Well, what are they? For male, duh, it's usually erectile dysfunction. For women, anorgasmia or just don't have any sex drive, just not interested anymore. Well, do all these people really have a disease? <laughs> Maybe not, with our model. Interestingly, the best predictor of sexual dysfunction is low satisfaction with one sexual partner. <laughs> so, if one regains normal functioning when changing partners, you get somebody else, or if the relationship with the current partner improves, do they really have an internal disorder rather than a social disease? You see, it depends on what situation they're in. Don't label them as having a disease, or do they need therapy? They need a new partner and they're cured. Ah, or drugs. Ah, the answer, the last question is of course yes. You need drugs. Agra, help those guys with ED get and keep an erection. I will applaud getting in the media again, Bob Dole, saying I've got an ED problem. Gee, here's someone of this stature saying, I've got a problem. He's bringing her out of the closet. Can you talk to your doctor about it? You can. Guys would be chicken to come in to talk to this. After Dole came out, they'd come out of the closet and say, hey, Doc, you know, uh, I got that, I got that thing. <coughs> That was great. Originally designed and marketed for us more mature citizens. <laughs> the kind of when things aren't going so well, they help out a little bit. But what does big mark? What does marketing do? Take you a while until you get that. I'm gonna leave it on until more of you laugh because. You have to use your imagination here. If not, talk to the person next to you. No, you don't have to. Just want to make sure you get this. This is important. Because it's, showing that it's aimed at a little younger audience, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because Pfizer's Viagra, their sales from 203 to 217. Now, this is in millions of dollars, but look at This is in thousands. So guess what? If you do your math, those are billions. $1.879 billion profit. 2016, $1.56 billion. One drug. 
marketing to one group of people. Okay, let's change gears. Post-traumatic stress disorder, especially as it relates to disasters and war. Disasters and wars are especially good for decreasing mental illness. Anybody going to buy that one? <laughs> Disasters and wars are good for decreasing mental illness. That's counterintuitive, isn't it? Well, let's see. Unless you're killed or wounded, of course. I mean, don't forget to take those people off. That's bad for you. Sebastian Younger in his book, Tribe, states, Star, important. We have a strong instinct to belong to small groups defined by clear purpose and understanding, tribes. This tribal connection has been largely lost in modern society, but regaining it may be the key to our psychological survival. Hmm. Excellent book. I highly suggest reading it. What's this a picture of? London, right. All these people live in the tube, right? Did a lot of them have to do that? Yep. The Blitz. September 7, 1940, German bombers began hitting London. Thousands of tons of explosives. At one interval, it was for 57 days straight. The bombings continued from September all the way to May. Eight million women and children endured these horrific conditions. Think about it. How would you predict that the public would react to this repeated trauma? <coughs> anyway. Depressed. Depressed? Anxiety. Anxiety. Cowboy out. Yeah. How else? Anger. Anger? Hate. Would it be good for them in a huff? What? Comradeship. Ah, comradeship. Ah. English authorities, they were worried about this. And others tried to anticipate, before the war came here, what would be the public's reaction to the bombing. They feared major societal breakdown, predicted, with the aerial bombing. Of course, that was what the Germans hoped would happen. British society would fall apart. Creating mass hysteria and anarchy. Casualties predicted at 35,000 a day. The Churchill government assumed the worst. The emergency planners were reluctant even to build public bomb shelters because they worried People would just move in and simply never move out. You know, the bombs start falling. <laughs> hey, I'm just going to protect my bomb shelter. You know, you guys get out. Nobody's, they're not going to go out and let anybody else in. So they said, why does they not even build them? Economic production would plummet. No, nobody's going to go to work with you dropping bombs on you at night. Besides the large number of physical casualties and injuries, we anticipated that huge numbers of people would develop shell shock and severe psychological trauma. Every day, all of a sudden, bombs start raining down. What's that going to do to your psyche? The breakdown of law and order and looting and crime were anticipated, right? There's no more place around. Oh, that store's open. I need this, that food. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Many Londoners got up in the morning and walked to work as usual and trudged to shelters or the tube stations in the evening. Conduct was so good in the shelters that volunteers never had to summon the police to maintain order. Almost immediately, laws, quote, not enforced by the police or wards, but by the people in the shelters were set up and maintained. Interestingly, beer consumption didn't even increase, and church attendance did not suffer. Wow. Wait a minute. Holy cow. The bombing failed to produce any mass hysteria. Before the war predictions of individual psychiatric breakdown was 4 million. They said one of these 4 million people are going to go nuts. But in reality, all over Great Britain, emissions went down. Emergency rooms saw an average of two cases of bomb neurosis a week. A week. Psychiatrists were in amazement when not only did cases of depression and suicide go down, that many of the chronic patients were also less symptomatic in general. So chronic patients are not symptomatic. What the heck is going on? The great sociologist Neil Durkheim was the first to notice positive effects of war. When European countries went to war, the suicide rate dropped. 
psychiatric wards in Paris were strangely empty during both world wars. Researchers noticed the similar findings during the civil wars in Spain, in Algeria, in Lebanon. The riots and violence in Northern Ireland demonstrated the same. So this isn't an isolated. The Brits think, well, we're the, you know, it's our British background. Well, these other folks, the same thing kind of happened. Psychologist H. A. Lyons found suicide rate in Belfast dropped 50% during the riots in 69 and 70. Dropped. Homicide and other violent crimes went down. Depression rates for both men and women fell dramatically, experiencing the greatest drop in the most violent districts. County Derry, on the other hand, which suffered almost no violence at all, saw male rates of depression rise rather than fall. Lyons hypothesized that men in the peaceful areas were depressed because they couldn't help their society by participating in the struggle. Question. How does the biologic brain reductionist model either predict or explain these findings? If somebody can answer that question, I'd like to listen. <laughs> it should be going literally nuts with what's going on. What would the findings be for major national, natural disasters? National, not war enough. Well, Okay, what about hurricanes? What about Houston? What about huge earthquakes that we see all the time in the press? This is the big one they had in Chile. All of a sudden, thousands of people die. What natural disasters? Tropical cyclones, as you can see. They're the biggie. That includes uh, you know, hurricanes and cyclones in other parts of the world. Severe storms, droughts, heat waves, floods shows both economic loss to these. Star, the exact same phenomenon is clearly demonstrated in communities hit by natural or man-made disasters. They almost never collapse into chaos and disorder. In the U.S., there was a drop in the crime rate in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Drop. In every disaster in the U.S. from earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, or 9-11, communities rallied and mental health greatly improves for almost all. Similar findings occur in other countries with earthquakes, tsunamis, mudslides, or cyclones, no matter the time period or the political regime in power. Pretty interesting. Why do such large scale disasters produce such mentally healthy conditions? Developing plans for a number of research projects, Charles A. Fritz, PhD sociologist, Chicago University, said therapeutic community is what he coined. He looked into the sociology of what's going on in this in disasters. And this is what he concluded. He and 25 researchers really studied this in detail. Concluded that modern society has greatly disrupted the social bonds that have always characterized the human experience. And that disasters thrust people back into a more ancient, organic way of relating. Disasters create a community of sufferers that allow individuals to experience an immensely reassuring connection to others. When you're down in that tube station with everybody else, there's a heat. As people come together to face an existential threat, class differences are temporarily erased, income disparities become irrelevant, race overlooked, and individuals are assessed simply what they are willing to do for the group. This is a kind of fleeting social utopia that is enormously gratifying to the average person and downright therapeutic to people who suffer, suffering from mental illness. When you're in any of those situations, do those things matter? No. This finding harkens back to my previous class, why can't we all get along? 
Remember the theme of that was, we can't get along because we're all tribal. And my tribe, or my little sub thing, is yours, and I just retreat to my tribe and protect it at the exclusion of everybody else, thoughts, facts, whatever. As I tried to show that these are deeply wired into our brains, both neural circuitry and biochemical responses. So I tried to show in the other class that this is not just thinking, this is wired in, hardwired. And these responses to trauma and natural disasters are the same. Our brains are still back in the forest, regardless how intellectually sophisticated we think we are. Other evidence for the strength of this claim is found from survivors of disasters and wars. Many recount that they almost, not really, but almost wish for return to those traumatic times. As a return to a more normal life now seems more empty, petty, and unfulfilling. Now they come back to the real world and they see this stuff on TV and they see what their neighbors do and they go back to the racism and the, and the economic inequalities and all the crap that's going on and they go like, man, back then this, we were all looked out for one another. It was different. And it's a good time for a break because now this leads us to the combatants. So we just talked here about what's going on with the folks. What about our fighting guys? What's going on in their head? So let's take a break and then we'll reconvene. Thank you all for taking your seats and we will restart our class with JR. It's all yours. Sounds still okay in the back? Yeah. Okay. Now I'll lead this to the combatants. Post-traumatic stress disorder in combat veterans. Well, let's answer some que this question from some of you. Why do veterans have post-traumatic stress disorder? Anybody? Away from your family. Away from your family. Or from the family, actually. What? They're sent to, and then it's brought back faster than they did during the war. During the other war. During the war, World War. When they were over at their seas, they were there. Now, they're here, and they're back. back, and they're here. So the deployment times are shorter now. Yeah. It's them going, so that's, what other things cause our soldiers to have so much trouble? Seeing Brain war. injury. Pardon? Seeing Brain injury. injury. Brain injuries. What? Just the stress of threat of death. The stress of threat of death. You, you can get killed any time. That's a little stressful, isn't it? And there are other reasons why you think we have so much post-traumatic stress disorder in our vets. When they, you when, vets? When they get home, the group they're used to tying to so closely because of their situation is no longer there. The people around them don't understand him. The people around them don't understand because they're a different group. So they come back into society and they're a different group. Good point. Well, let's see. It officially became a disease. Again, nothing's official until the American Psychiatric <laughs> Society puts it in DSM. And so in 1980, they said, yep, they got this condition. And we're going to put it in our manual as a diagnosable condition. So if you have this, 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 and this, then you have this disorder. And that's important later for disability and medical treatment. Because if you don't, I told you, if you don't have a diagnosis on stuff and you go on to get treatment or insurance, forget it. You've got to have a code number. So what are the symptoms and why do we get it? From an evolutionary perspective, PS, PTSD makes a lot of sense. That's exactly what you want to have if your life is in danger. You want to be hypervigilant. You want to avoid situations where you are not in complete control. You want to react to strange noises and sleep lightly and wake easily. You want to have flashbacks and nightmares that remind you of specific threats to your life. You want to be both angry and depressed. For anger keeps you ready to fight. It's got that adrenaline going. And depression keeps you from getting too active 
and getting in harm's way. Eh, maybe I won't go out of my cage tonight. So, if you got this dude lurking around yeah. your place, aren't all those things really important to do if you want to survive yes. and pass your gene set? Yeah. So this is evolutionary program. It's great. We're supposed to have it. There's nothing wrong with it. Flashbacks also remind you there's danger out there. Don't go out cavalier for a walk outside your cave just because it's a nice spring day. All humans and most mammals react to trauma in this way. It may be unpleasant, but it's preferable to getting killed. Animals go through the same things. If you've got any animal you know about and put a danger around it or have it threatened with danger, it becomes skittish, right? Sleeps with one eye open. So all the things that this is programmed into us. So it's not an abnormal condition. Some facts on post-traumatic stress disorder. It's supposed to decrease with time. It occurs not only with combatants, but with support personnel in correspondence and better with the troops. I was under the impression, well, it's just the guys out there fighting on the front lines that are going to get this. But no, there'd be correspondence, support people. It occurs in all wars and at all times. However, the amount and degree have varied widely. In different wars, in the same country at different times, and in different cultures. <coughs> United States now is the highest post-traumatic stress disorder rate in its history. It has the highest reported rate in the world. We're number one. Tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans reported symptoms of P. TSD, but the rate is much higher for recent vets. American soldiers experienced almost twice the rate of British soldiers who were in combat with them. Now wait a minute, here's some other soldiers that are fighting along with you. They go back and they don't, you have twice the rate that they do, but you were in the same situation. The U.S. spends over $4 billion annually just for disability compensation. And despite billions spent on treatment, Nearly half of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have applied for permanent disability. Wow. Yeah, that's a big wow. Today's vets have one quarter of the mortality rate, as did soldiers in World War II, and about a third the death rate of Vietnam vets. So dying is better than this last wars. However, they report three times the number of disabilities that the Vietnam vets did, physical, psychological, or both. Now, some of that's good to good medical care to keep them alive and bring them back. But we'll see, it's much deeper than that. Current vets usually receive positive receptions when returning home with spontaneous, thank you for your service, comments, honors at football games and sporting events, first seating on airplanes, versus the often, Toxic receptions many Vietnam veterans received if I'm coming home. So some, and I thought, well, these vets, we're, we're honoring them. Where in Vietnam, you came back, like, you killed all those villages, you killed those Vietnamese people, and it was, it did very different. But wait a minute. We should have less than if that was a, a main driver force, a reception back home. And a star, 20 vets commit suicide each day day in the United States. Each day. World War II vets didn't do that. Vietnam vets didn't do that. What the heck is going on? Suicide frequency, 22 a day. This is every 65 minutes. That says, I'm out of here. Sadly, that was once a war story. We lost 22 soldiers on that day. That was a good war story. But it was only just one day. But now, suicide and depression take people out at the same rate every day. What about veterans versus civilians? Here's the civilian rate of suicide. Here's the veterans rate. Twice that of people that are here in society. 
War with all violence, killing, and seeing people killed, both the enemy and fellow soldiers, should be the determining factor in post-traumatic stress disorder. Right? All the violence, buddies killed, seeing everybody killed, this, this should be the main driver of it. Why it's so horrible and ugly. It's not. Combat veterans who were under fire were no more likely to be killed or to kill themselves than those who were never under fire. So the suicide rate, you didn't have to be on the front lines. You're just in. Pilots of unmanned drones who watched their missiles kill humans by remote control from a silo in Kansas have the same PTSD as pilots who actually fly the missions in war. They're doing this remote control on TV. They got the same BTS. During the Yom Kippur War, rear-based troops who had fairly light casualties nonetheless suffered psychological breakdowns three times that of the frontline troops. Oh, wait a minute. The people in the back lines, this is another country, they suffered more than the ones up front. Similarly, in the U.S. Army's uh, Seventh Corps, 80% of psychiatric casualties came from support units that took almost no incoming, for, incoming fire during the Gulf War. So if you're in the Gulf War, this other corps, they're just support. How do I explain that? It appears that post-traumatic stress disorder that is not adequately explained by the traumatic wartime experiences themselves. What a joke is that? Something else has got to be going on. It appears that post-traumatic stress disorder that is not adequately explained, I just read that by the experience itself, the answer is found in both the other psychosocial events that occur with deployment and the experiences of vets on return to society. Put a star by that. That's where the answers are. Psychosocial events that occur with the deployment and when you come home. The vast majority of traumatized vets now returning have higher rates of PTSD, depression, and alienation than their fathers and their grandfathers had. It's not genetics. They don't have different brains. It's also well known that Peace Corps volunteer experience Volunteers experience major depression at the rate of one in four upon returning to the U.S. Peace Corps. And the rate doubles if they were evacuated from a host country during wartime or some other kind of emergency. How do you reconcile that fact? Therefore, the problem doesn't seem to be trauma on the battlefield so much as re-entry into society. The answer is the same as our explanation for the low level of psychological trauma seen in the civilian population during war or disaster. It's to return to the tribal psycho-social milieu that is so powerful and intoxicating, and the subsequent loss of this upon returning home. So we'll leave that up for a second to process that. See if you agree with that. Remember what happened in disasters? So, getting this tribalism and then having it taken away from them. What else explains the facts? Why do so many recent vets redeploy voluntarily to put their lives in repeat danger? Why when you get out, when you, your family says, stay here, no, I'm going to redeploy again. I'm going to go back for a second. I'm going to go back for a third. But you can get killed, you get maimed. Why do you you're nuts. You're not. There's something pulling you back. Why do many veterans, as did civilians, actually talk about missing the war? Most miss the tremendous feeling of belonging and companionship that many had never experienced before. The emotional bonds forged in a combat unit can compare to almost nothing else humans can experience. In the book, The Good Wars, former gunner in the 62nd artillery told the interviewer, 
For the first time in our lives, we're in a tribal sort of situation that we can help each other without fear. You have these 51 guys who, for the first time in their lives, were not in a competitive society. I like that very much. It was the absence of competition and boundaries and all those phony standards that created the thing I loved about the Army. We were never alone. When you went to sleep, there was always someone by you. There were no class distinctions. Your race didn't matter, nor did it make any difference how rich you were or how much money your daddy made. We didn't really care about your sexual orientation. We were all in this together. You knew your comrade would be willing to give his frickin' life for you, as you would for him or her. Where else does this ever happen? What is more powerful than that? You will give your life an instant for another human being, regardless of sex, race, whatever, and they would do the same for you. But don't get any better than that, as a species. So what happens when they return home? What do they encounter in the current U.S. society? Do they come back to good jobs and meaningful employment? Do they have a good social support network? Do they have adequate and timely health care? Do their lives have the same intensity of meaning and purpose they had in the military? Can they support themselves and their families, or do they assume a victim, victim's role with PTSD and permanent disability? Virtually all mammals seem to benefit from companionship. Even lab rats recover more quickly from trauma if they are caged with other rats than if they are caged alone. As a rat, it's going to have post-traumatic stress disorder, but you cage him after with other rats, and he is not as bad. Star, big star. In humans, lack of social support has been shown to be twice as reliable at predicting post-traumatic stress disorder as the severity of the trauma itself. So it's not how bad the thing was or you did. It's how your society and the support it's given you after. Another factor is who serves in the U.S. military. If it's not is it voluntary, a significant number of young men enlist, not because they are strongly patriotic, but to escape bad social, economic, and legal situations at home. In a retrospective analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry in 2014, men with military service are twice as likely to have reported sexual assault in their childhood as are men who never served. Pretty impressive statistic. This was not true during the draft. Sexual abuse is a well-known predictor of depression and other mental illnesses. I should say issues, illnesses. It must be contributing to the increase in PTSD seen today. What about other societies who go to war? What's going on here? What about other countries? Israel is arguably the only modern country that retains a sufficient sense of community to mitigate the effects of combat on a large scale. They're kind of a war almost all the time, aren't they? Despite decades of war, the PS, PTSD rate is usually around 1%. 1%. This is probably due to, one, the close proximity to the war. This is, they're fighting their own territory. This is their own, the war isn't over there someplace. It's in their backyard. That makes a little difference. It makes a lot of difference. Two, national military service. Almost everybody's this patent. It isn't like, well, you know, I went, you came back, and other people understood that. And a shared public meeting Oh, uh, excuse me. The, those who come back from combat are reintegrated into a society where those experiences were well understood. And shared public meaning also gives a context for their losses and sacrifice. Anthropologists Cork, Hoffman, Abramson have identified three factors that seem to 
crucially affect a combatant's transition back into society. One, first, cohesive and egalitarian tribal societies do a very good job at mitigating the effects of trauma. Many modern societies are exactly the opposite. They're hierarchical and alienating. America's great wealth, although blessed in many ways, has allowed for the growth of an individualistic society that suffers high rates of depression and anxiety. Both are correlated with chronic PTSD. Secondly, ex-combatants shouldn't be seen or be encouraged to see themselves as victims. Firefighters and police are often deeply traumatized by the death of colleagues and civilians without being viewed through the lens of victimhood. Lifelong disability payments, though appropriate for a few, should not be used for a disease which is both treatable and usually not chronic. Most veterans know that passivity of victimhood in combat could have gotten them killed. They need to help transferring this attitude back into civilian life. Thirdly, probably most important, veterans need to feel that they're just as necessary and productive back in society as they were on the battlefield. In the United States, we valorize them with words and posters and signs, but we don't give them what they really want and need, jobs. All the praise in the world doesn't mean anything if you're not recognized by society, in society by someone who contribute, can contribute valuable labor to your society in some way or another. Social resilience. Good term. Recent studies of something called social resilience have identified resource sharing and egalitarian wealth distribution as a major component of a society's ability to recover from hardship. Resource sharing and egalitarian wealth equal distribution. Hmm. Societies that rank high on social resilience, such as the kibbutz settlements in Israel, provide soldiers with a significantly stronger buffer against PTSD. In fact, social resiliency is even a better predictor of trauma recovery than the resiliency of the person himself. Unfortunately, the United States ranks very low on all three of the above. Right? So, duh, why do we have high PTSD? Many lessons from the Iroquois. Well, first of all, gender roles. Iroquois women were in charge of the hunting, trading in war. Iroquois women were in charge of the farming, owned the property, they made the decisions. They had a lot of power in their villages. They were in charge of the big long houses where they all lived. They made decisions about how to use the village's farmland. What they're going to plant. Who's going to plant it? They were also in charge of choosing the Sakams. The Sakams went to the Grand Council meetings. The importance of clan mothers. Clan mothers were the leaders of the clan. The great law of peace gave the clan mother ownership of the chieftainship title. This means the clan mothers had the responsibility of selecting the chiefs for their own clan. The title of clan mother was usually passed on by your female relatives. So the clan mothers, they picked the chiefs. It wasn't the strongest in battle or the best looking or the best political connection. The clan mamas got together and said, this guy or this guy, he's going to be our chief. And if he doesn't do a good job, they go, you're retired. Pretty impressive. So what criteria did they try to use for that? In choosing the chief, clan mother would look for characteristics such as honesty and kind-heartedness, ability to think clearly, knowledge of traditional ceremonies, loyalty to the family, ability to uphold the great law, ability to represent the people fairly, and ability to withstand criticism. Does this sound like any of our current leaders? <laughs> The Iroquois nation understood the transformative power of war when they developed parallel systems of government to protect, protect civilians from warriors and vice versa. Okay, so here you're in this tribe. 
and everything's going along, but then you got to go fight some other tribe. But then that's over, and then I got to go back. Well, we're in the same situation today. We're going to go fight, war, this, this, this constant tension. Iroquois folk, they had this all figured out. Peacetime leaders, called these Sacklums, were chosen by the women and had complete, complete authority over the civil affairs of the tribe. However, when war broke out, male war leaders took over with the sole concern being the physical survival of the tribe. All of a sudden, change in power. They weren't concerned with justice or harmony or fairness. They're only concerned with defeating the enemy. They're not going to worry about all this other crud. If the enemy tried to negotiate and end hostilities, however, this is clever. It was the Sockums and not the war leaders who negotiated and made the final decision. So it's not the war leaders that are going to make the decision about are we going to have peace or not, and what are the conditions of the peace going to be. Oh, we want our smart Sockum back the peacetime ruler, to negotiate, not the war lord. And if the offer was accepted, the war leaders stepped down so that the Sakums could resume leadership of the tribe. So war is over. Here's the time back. Back to peacetime. Isn't that unbelievably clever? Yes. Their warriors didn't have any trouble, post-traumatic stress. They came back, they did their hunting, they did the fishing, they went to a society that just changed gears. Now, Iroquois also were modeled for the new country. I don't know about you, but I didn't learn about this mission. Uh, you know, the Indians there, they're pretty. And women and, and squaws. And, well, yeah, some of the Indians did get together. Well, gee, Native America and the evolution of democracy. Ben Franklin. Some people in here are reading Ben Franklin's autobiography or biography about him. You should learn about this. They had the League of the Iroquois. They had this league that started in about 1400, and it was among these tribes. First it was five and then six. So you got all these tribes in New York. How are you going to keep them together? How are you going to make one tribe happy with the other and not kill it and do all this stuff? They formed the League of Nations. Then they got together periodically, and they talked about their problems, and they handled it. This went on for over 300 years. How many countries on this planet do you know that have groups like that? So Franklin, when they were forming the, the United States, looking for a model for constitution, he went back in history. And he looked at Greek and Roman societies and governments and looked at all of those because they wanted to get a model for the United States. And then they looked in Europe and said, well, you know, we don't like England's model, but what about these other ones? And he could not come up with any kind of good model. Gee, guess who had a model? The states, you know, we want our individual rights, our individual practices, but we want to be together in a cohesive, higher social system. Oh, gee, the Iroquois have that. Had that. So when they came together with the different tribes, they could get together, and this went along. Obviously, they came, became the most powerful nation in that part of the, nobody messed with them, because they could all come together and be unified, and take on other tribes or other people, invaders, whatever. So here's the picture of the chiefs in June 11, 1776. The visiting Iroquois chiefs were formally invited to a meeting hall of the Continental Congress. To explain how they kind of did things. I think that's pretty cool. So the Constitution owes its notion of democracy to the Iroquois tribes, including freedom of religion, freedom of speech, separation of powers and government. The only difference is Iroquois included women and non-whites. <laughs> oh, the chief. In Iroquois society, leaders are encouraged to remember seven generations in the past and consider seven generations in the future when making decisions that affect the people. That's one of the criteria they picked for their leader. Pretty impressive. 
Oh, here's the, this, you can take this slide out, but it's my editorial. Unfortunately, many of our current leaders, including our great white chief, either never learned history or else can't remember it, nor can they see the consequences of their decisions even one generation into the future, let alone seven. Am I right or wrong? Yes. How different from the Iroquois? And for you women, this is, this is also powerful stuff. So this is a cartoon, and here's all these women marching over here. It's not very good, but gee, Susan B. Anthony, Ann Howard Shaw, Elizabeth Stanton, leading a parade of women. This is in May 16, 1914. What are they marching for? Women's suffrage, which doesn't happen for about another six years. Yeah. Remember, 1920, they got the national vote. And here are these Iroquois women kind of watching these American women of the 20th century kind of marching along. And they said, well, you know, I think we're ahead of you in women's rights. <laughs> Savagery to civilization. So this is what it said on that thing. We, the women of the Iroquois, own the land, the lodge, the children. Ours is the right to adoption, life, or death. Ours is the right to raise up and depose chiefs. Ours is the right to representation in all councils. Ours is the right to make and abrogate treaties. Ours is the supervision over domestic and foreign policies. Ours is the trusteeship of the tribal property. <coughs> Our lives are valued against, again, as high as males. Could that be a, a woman's yeah. thing? So this is the Iroquois women having this, excuse me, hundreds of years before. I thought that was cool. I said it only. Okay, so the last 10, 15 minutes we're going to change. What about addiction in our model? I think we see where we're at with that. This is a cover of uh, National Geographic, September. Science of addiction. I'm really interested. Why is there such an increase in substance abuse? All these kids and chronic abuse, what's going on? Well, of course, the second page of the article shows a nice picture of a CAT scan. Somebody's had an MRI of the brain. And there's a page on all the neurotransmitters that are going on. And the, the mechanisms that we talked about in earlier classes of dopamine. And dopamine is the addictive transmitter substance. You give people a dopamine, they become addicted to stuff. So can we block the addiction? But, well, it's more common. But again, the whole article is about the brain. Are there genes for alcoholism or other substance abuse? Remember, the biomedical model looks at chemicals in the brain and genes. We go, oh, it's genes. Genes are explaining this stuff. So why is there such an increase in substance abuse? It's not a simple answer, but the main answers are probably not going to be found with the current biomedical model. That's my hypothesis. Wait a minute, Coca-Cola. Hmm. Gee, back in those days, what was in Coca-Cola? Yeah, Coca. So, yeah, oh, let's drink it. Cocoa wine. Oh, you can buy opium over the counter. For relief of headache, pain, crampy backache. Paragoric. Gee, what's paragoric? Opium. Well, this stuff, you don't need a prescription. And bear produced heroin. So you can get heroin. Oh, this is over the counter, folks. I don't know how many you did that. So it wasn't until 1914 in the Harrison Act that made those things, now you have to have a script. <coughs> then we have epidemics of people chilling out with their opium and stuff. Now some people probably enjoyed it a little more, too much, but it was not a problem, right? No major addiction problems. Now a natural experiment, I mentioned this before, on heroin addiction occurred during the Vietnam War. So over there, they say about half of the population, military population, tried opium or heroin in the tour. But only about one out of five of them came back addicted. And of those, 95% were completely drug free after a year. So they got exposed to this big bad drug, but they came back here. At that time, most of them were able to re enter society and things did better, and it didn't happen. Clearly, it was related to the social environment that most returned to that made the difference. Remember Rat Park from an <laughs> earlier class? Rat Park Addiction Study. So the hypothesis was that drugs don't cause addiction. 
and that the apparent addiction to opiate commonly observed in laboratory rats exposed to them is attributable to living conditions. Wait a minute, it's not the drug? So, remember, to refresh your memory, they took all these rats in a cage and they gave them choice, water bottle or morphine bottle. And the rats in the new cage, gee, they opted for, what do you think they opted for? What's the picture tell you they opted for? Yeah. They got zoned up, a lot of them died. They became addicted to the morphine. These are the rats in the new cages. They said, what if we build a cool rat park? What if we give them free space, free food, free sex, free everything? Let's make a nice rat park. Okay, but let's give them the same choice. They can go up here and get water, or they can get morphine, hydrochloride. And what do the rats do? Eh, you don't want to mess with that opium stuff, or with the heroin. But none of the rats get addicted. Given the chance to live in a normal society with comfortable living and social contact, the rats, they didn't buy it. Follow-up experiment. What would happen to already addicted rats that were then moved into the rat park? So you get some rats, you get them addicted in their little cages, and now you take them out of the cages and you put them back in the rat park, and see what happens. Well, yeah, they were dependent, so some of them had a little twitching around for a while, yet they weren't that severe, but yeah, in the rat park, they avoided the morphine. What about other animals? Mongoose in Hawaii, hallucinogens. Uh, scientists planted hallucinogenic drugs, uh, uh, morning glory, around where these mongooses were. And they would bite the plant a little bit, but yeah, they, they didn't go for it. So then he, he's, this one mongoose, there's a flood or something, and its, its nest gets totally wiped up with mud, and its partner dies. So he videotapes. This mouse goes, or excuse me, the mongoose goes and starts eating the hallucinogenic stuff to zone out. Water buffalo in Vietnam. They had morphine, uh, or fields of the precursor morphine, which is opium. But the water buffalo don't go eating, getting spaced out with all this. Until there's bombing going on. Then when there's bombing all the time going on, guess what the water buffalo do? go into the morphine fields. Elephants in Bengali, their territory is getting less and less. The forests are getting cut down. They want to have this uh, big festival. People got all this rice, wine, and booze stored in, the, in, the, in some of these buildings. So what do the elephants do? They're kind of stressed out, so they go in, break into it, and they all get, go on a big drunk fest and do lots of damage. Based on a book called Intoxication. So the elephants were not too happy. <laughs> elephants on drunken rampage kill three people. <laughs> Seventy elephants. So, what's the point I'm making? That these animals did not use these other drugs. We think we're the only ones that use drugs. They used it when they were under severe psychological trauma, even though they had the drug available. <laughs> That's rats, other animals. What are the risk factors for addiction in humans? We know what these are. Risk factors, bad home environment, bad parenting, academic failure, low aspirations, poor social skills, parental substance abuse, protective factors. All these are social factors, aren't they? Schools, bonds, expectations. What are the drugs people get hooked on? Yeah, we got heroin, which is a major epidemic, I agree, but look at tobacco, alcohol, marijuana. Blue is the people who have ever tried it. And then the shorter bar is the people who became addicted. So look at people are trying alcohol, but only a small proportion. If the drug was an automatic cook, wouldn't you expect those lines to be closer together? Yes, and they're not. So DSM-5, criteria for substance abuse. And out of this list, I don't have time to go through them, but it says, have you had two of the following during a 12-month period? So therefore, if you got a little, ate too much to drink at an Iowa football game, and then at a marriage, or just some night, you just drank too much and you know you shouldn't have done it, you could be classified with a substance disorder. Fortunately, they, they say, well, 
okay, you have no diagnosis if there's no criteria, mild, moderate, or severe. So if you got more than six of these, yeah, so at least they, they're getting better at quantitating it. Now, illness and substance abuse. Gee, really, really important because both. Nearly half of individuals with, with a past year substance use disorder also had mental disorder. Circles overlap. Are we surprised? Why are people using the substances for mental and social reasons, right? They're twice as likely. So about 9 million Americans have a co-occurring disorder with substance abuse and mental illness. So if you put them in a treatment program for their alcoholism or their heroin or whatever, but you don't address their mental illness issues, what do you think the relapse rate's going to be? And gee, guess it, it is. Next class, we're going to talk about them. How do you fix that? How about DUI? These people are uh, repeat DUI offenders. Well, gee, they got some other problems too. So you just throw them in jail for the DUI, and they get out. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to drive again, kill somebody. What about our genes? The key to alcoholism is likely to reside in the effects of alcohol in the brain. Again, our biomedical model, it's in the genes, folks, because he's a gene researcher. What do you expect? What if you have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism? Is that the determining factor? What would determine the expression of that gene? So you got the gene, but it's got to get expressed. So what would be the probability of developing alcoholism if you were raised in, say, a Mormon culture or a Navajo culture? Predisposition. Which one's going to become the alcoholic problem? Or if I took you, any of you, and put you on a reservation, didn't give you a job, took ready your heritage, don't you think the chances of alcoholism in that situation would go up dramatically? Adopted children with high genetic risk raised in middle-class foster homes versus those who are raised in lower-class foster homes. What do you think? Alcoholism in the lower class. Wait a minute, they got the same genetics. But what kind of foster care are they raised in? Daughters of Danish alcoholics adopted away versus siblings raised at home. Gee, your dad's an alcoholic, you're sitting, so they ship your sister out to another family, and you just got stuck here, which one do you think is going to end up having an alcohol problem? The woman saying with alcoholic. So again, how are you raised? Not just genetics. Isn't this true for almost all of our mental illnesses? And I'd say yes. So, in class four, we will then look for treatment models based on, I think, our new paradigm. So how has technology, the smartphone in particular, affected our mental health? And I'm going to say it really has. It's changed society significantly. And mental health, by the way. What should be the treatment model for most mental diseases? What role does the healthcare system play in all this? Hmm, that's going to be kind of important. How does social economic policy affect these treatments in our country and in others? And finally, what can we do locally to affect positive change. So what can we do in, here in our area? And I'll update you on things that we are and have been doing. So hopefully we gave you something to think about. And um, so next time we'll start with <laughs> smartphones, storage generation, I don't know. So you can think about that or talk about that with some of your younger cohorts, among yourself too, but your children and grandchildren. Hey, what do you think about these all these smartphones? Does that have any effect back in our home? And we are going to answer the two homework questions from last time about those women that we got stranded up in Greenland and over in Cambodia, right? They're in bad shape. So we got to figure out how they're going to get better. And trust me, it's not going to be from Senator of the script from Pfizer or Sur. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Remember, please to turn off your T-coil and turn on your cell phones.
and we'll see you next week. Thank you. I better do that. It'll be Tuesday.